I brought notes up because uh, I'm going to be sharing data that is less than 48 hours old. So hopefully everyone can get really excited about that. So I'm here to talk about the work that the Nature Conservancy is doing to leverage the amazing research and uh, and farmer networking that, that our partners are doing and trying to bring that to other audiences to help drive adoption. And um, I'm gonna mostly talk about non-operator landowners, which has been alluded to um, a little bit about uh, some farmer advisors and um, also bring in a public opinion poll that we just finished. So a little bit of this work is uh, not funded uh, by, by FAR or our um, matching donors to that. Just I think you'll, you'll notice which of it is a little bit farther outside of their mission area, but almost all of this work um, is part of the project we're doing together and uh, it's all towards our ambitious goals of increasing adoption of soil health practices. So uh, those of us in this room uh, don't need to review the uh, significant conservation uh, benefits, off-farm benefits that soil health can provide. These are kind of lit review numbers of the, the benefits of adopting soil health management practices on half of U.S. row crops. These would be annual numbers. But these numbers start to matter when we're talking to people who are farther uh, from agriculture, who are still important for driving adoption, for supporting growers in helping put these practices into place, but who may be driven by other values, um, you know, feeding a growing population with nutritious food, provision of clean water, and um, both mitigating and being resilient to climate change. So I'm gonna start, as I said, with our work on non-operator landowners, and this is where um, I've got some fresh data. So unfortunately, I don't have uh, beautiful figures to show this, and we're still kind of digesting this ourselves, but I'll be referencing a little bit of the numbers um, that we just got back from a survey that we're conducting with some partners. So this work on non-operator landowners has really um, been advanced uh, in recent years by American Farmland Trust, Purdue University, Utah State, Iowa State, many others, and the Nature Conservancy is excited to be partnering with them to, to help advance this issue. So uh, this is a map of rented farmland in the U.S. So across the nation, about 50% of acres are um, operated by farmers who do not own the land. In the Midwest, uh, that number is upwards of 60%, and in the few studies that have been done, conservation practices are adopted at about 50% lower rates on uh, acres that a grower rents. So even the, the same um, operator who owns some land and rents some land is less likely to put these practices into place onto land that they are renting. This makes sense. A lot of these practices take years, especially around soil health, to generate economic returns. So if you're working on annual leases, it's hard to kind of have the incentive to, to do this. So um, we, we just conducted a survey to understand more about who these non-operator landowners are, and I'll be referring to this. And uh, we, we got the data back from Indiana, Iowa, and Illinois. And uh, in Iowa, 84% of the leases are annual. In Indiana, 73% are annual, and in Illinois, 72% are annual. And often these leases are verbal. So in Iowa, it's 47% verbal, in Indiana, 70% verbal, and in Illinois, 62%. So this is starting to, uh, to help us understand what can we do to help these uh, landowners and the growers come together to find solutions to uh, increase adoption of soil health management practices. So again, what, what do we know about these folks? So there was a uh, 2012 survey from USDA, the total survey that indicated that the majority are over 65 in the survey we just completed, the um, mean age was 73. They're increasingly female, and most are expected to transition the land to other family members, or that's their, their desire and their intent. Um, and again, from the data we just got back, they frequently visit the land, so um, multiple times per year. They do feel connected to the land. And contrary to what we were expecting, they're actually not very generationally removed from agriculture. So we were thinking, you know, it's very different to be talking about soil health uh, practices with someone who inherited the land and their great-grandparents are the ones who farmed it as compared to someone who, uh, you know, grew up on that farm and, and now is doing something else. So there actually is more generational connection um, based on the study we just finished than, than we expected. 
And what we were able to do um, in this survey that we, that we uh, conducted with American Farmland Trust, Utah State, and Iowa State, was start to dig in to a little more into what they think about conservation, where they get their information. So uh, first and foremost, which was uh, pretty exciting and heartening, is that most uh, non-operator landowners uh, rate trustworthiness of their operator as the most important factor in selecting who is uh, farming their land. And uh, when we kind of asked them to rank in importance what other factors they considered, actually the level, um, the, the rental rate that the operator was willing to pay was lowest. So there's a lot of interest in folks in taking care of their land, even when they're not the ones actively farming it. And interestingly, they um, rated at the top, well, I guess not interestingly, but uh, it very impactful to what we uh, can do in this space, is that they want to hear about conservation from the operator, from the farmer. They don't particularly want to hear about conservation from uh, the Nature Conservancy or, or, or others. They really want to be working uh, with, with their grower to make this happen, which is just you know, one other uh, important piece of why soil health partnerships work is so critical. And they did not uh, perceive significant barriers uh, to incorporating conservation into their leases, which is, which is very promising. So this is uh, from, this is again, we just got the raw results, so that's what I'm sharing today. But this is um, from uh, the survey in Iowa. And, uh, you know, again, these, these landowners really care about soil health, about conservation, and uh, they almost unanimously agreed, uh, or strongly agreed, that soil quality is an important decision when making um, management decisions. And they also found that, uh, we found that conservation was actually one of the issues where they felt like they needed to participate with their grower to find a solution. So generally they defer to the grower for management decisions, but when it came to conservation, they did want to be part of that con conversation and they felt that it was their responsibility to do so. So what can we do? Uh, what can we do to bridge this gap? Uh, we are uh, looking at the legal, financial, and technical assistance tools to help uh, t uh, increase adoption of soil health practices on rented land. So uh, looking first at the legal opportunities, uh, you know, we kind of went into this thinking, hey, one of the lowest hanging fruits is longer leases, right? Then there's more of an incentive to, to put these practices into place on the land. So based on interviews we've done, workshops we've done, uh, this doesn't seem uh, to be something that could scale and doesn't seem to be something that non-operator landowners are, are extremely interested in. Uh, so we want to look at estate planning as an opportunity. A lot of this land, you know, hundreds of thousands of acres every few years is being turned over. Hopefully, Gordon most landowners want that to be within their family. And so we can use uh, estate planning and providing uh, attorneys and others who are um, helping uh, landowners figure out how to pass land down through generations to put soil health uh, into um, trusts and partnerships. And uh, if anyone wants to talk more about that, I can, I can get into more detail, but there's opportunities both with land that has already been passed down through trusts as well as what's going to be inherited um, or sold within the family. We want to look at financial opportunities. Uh, interestingly, in our survey, you know, we kept bugging Wayne to say, you know, you got to find these metrics so we can tie these metrics to land value. And we thought, you know, if we can just show these people that they're going to increase their land value, they are going to invest in soil health. So in the results we just got back, uh, we asked kind of folks to, to check off so they could do more than one, uh, the most important financial reasons for owning land. And 80% uh, indicated an annual financial return was important to them. Only 30% indicated that the long-term real estate value of the land was important to them. So this uh, kind of helps uh, support what we were thinking that taxes, which are annual, uh, is going to be a way where we can help uh, provide some kind of financial incentive. So we're currently doing a study with some tax specialists on that. 
Uh, and finally, we're doing um, a study to just kind of ask the question of whether uh, technical assistance and information about soil health is sufficient or whether there really does need to be some kind of financial tie. Um, and I don't think I have a ton of time to go into that today, but uh, just a pretty interesting study we're doing providing landowners with information uh, about what soil health is, a lease template so they could work with their operator, in this case just to make it simple for the study, on uh, cover crops, to put cover crops into place. Um, and then of those kind of thousands of landowners who are getting that information, we're providing 200 of them with a financial incentive of $1,500 to put cover crops into place for two years. So we'll be able to compare whether uh, cover crops were adopted at higher rates by people who had that financial incentive or, or just the information. So um, the next uh, group that is absolutely critical for helping increase adoption, as uh, again, it's not news to those of us in this room, is farmer advisors. Uh, so we heard a lot about this already uh, this morning from uh, Jason about the work that they're doing, but it's critical for farmer advisors to be able to um, bring the message of soil health to their customers, but there are still a lot of questions around how to do that. And uh, we're working with them to help them demonstrate uh, leadership and innovation in this space and to show that they're being responsive to their customers who are interested in hearing about soil health and putting these practices into place on their land. So uh, one example is work we're doing through an RCPP project. So again, this involves lots of different partners uh, in um, the Big Pine watershed of Indiana. And we're actually working with Land Lakes and bringing some of their tools to uh, ag retailers so that they can uh, provide soil health recommendations to their growers and really demonstrate how soil health can be financially beneficial for them. At the same time, Nature Conservancy and others are kind of coming alongside that and uh, helping kind of ease the burden to enter into cost share programs to provide an additional financial benefit. And then, um, you know, the, the agri-retailers themselves with support from um, NRCS, Soil Water Conservation Districts, TNC, are helping provide them the technical assistance to actually get those practices into place. And we're seeing that retailers are really excited about this. They're really excited to be able to demonstrate their, their innovation and, and that, that they're constantly learning and providing um, resources to their customers. We held a field day in early June that had over 200 participants, and the kind of theme of that field day was building a competitive edge uh, with conservation. So again, tying it back to the, the economic benefit that this can provide. So a lot of these uh, stakeholders, whether they're non-operative landowners, companies, others, want to know what adoption rates are. So uh, the R3 organizations um, have decided to kind of set a very ambitious goal of 50% uh, adoption of soil health management practices on row crops by uh, 2025. So how do we know that that's happening? You know, we're, we're depending on Soil Health Institute to give us the measures of how you actually can measure soil health itself. But when we want to measure, you know, who, who's doing cover crops, who's actually putting these practices into place, we're really excited uh, to be partnering with uh, the Conservation Technology Information Center and Applied Geosolutions to uh, use remote sensing to be able to do some mapping that will be publicly available on uh, rates of adoption. Um, our current project is to measure those rates of adoption historically, so we can kind of pick up where CTIC left off with their transect survey, and from 2005 to 2017 provide public information on um, adoption rates and the kind of uh, environmental benefits associated with those through um, modeling that Applied Geosolutions does. So this is just uh, data that uh, we're just using for, for an example, but uh, next, April, we will have up on CTSC's website it's public information at the watershed level of adoption. So you could go, you know, say, I want to look up Indiana, 2008, here's their uh, cover crop acres. So we're uh, looking forward to having that and then using that to identify even more information on what drives adoption and, um, and how to get, get towards our really ambitious goal. So I'm going to finish up with a public opinion poll, and uh, this starts to get us to really those people who are quite uh, far from the farm. It's the same people that you know Jerry Lynch is trying to reach, these millions of consumers who um, buy food, don't always know where it's coming from. And uh, this poll was to look at um, states in the Mississippi, or along the Mississippi, Mississippi Basin states, and their understanding of the health of the river and um, 
the impacts that uh, nutrient loss have on the river. So this is just some of the questions from this poll. Uh, it was online, we got over 800 respondents, and it was conducted in early July. So um, most people do think that the health of local rivers and streams, as well as the Mississippi River, has gotten worse uh, over the past 10 years. So on the left here, local rivers and streams, on the right, the Mississippi River overall, and uh, this red is people who think it's gotten worse. When we asked them why the Mississippi River matters to them, most of them said uh, wildlife as well as the economics, the role that the river plays in transporting uh, agricultural industrial goods. The very bottom there is something we do every day and uh, drink water. So interestingly, that was to the general public not as important as some of the other benefits of the river. And then we asked them, you know, what, what should we do about it? And a little over half of them said, it, the river does require urgent attention, it's something we need to do. But then when we asked how high of a priority it is, they were pretty divided. Uh, so only 55% said it's one of the most important high priorities. So it starts to get to the challenge of motivating people. <laughs> and then we asked how much they'd be willing to pay to improve the health of the Mississippi. And while a quarter of them said nothing, <laughs> uh, about 40% say they'd pay five to $10 a year, which, uh, you know, if you think about the population, uh, that, that could be significant. And 12% said over $50 a year. I don't know if they'd all end up putting their money where their mouth is, but just kind of demonstrates what people think about. And when we asked about what farmers could do, kind of what they think about as uh, the role farmers could have in uh, helping uh, improve the health of the Mississippi, they gravitated towards the idea of uh, helping farmers innovate. So we're really excited that we get to work with Soil Health Institute and Soil Health Partnership to, to help farmers innovate. So um, I don't feel like I could be as eloquent about the strength of uh, getting to work with Soil Health Partnership and Soil Health Institute as uh, Lakeisha and Wayne and Elisa have already been, but you know, just wanna add that on behalf of the Nature Conservancy, we're so excited that as a science-based organization, we get to work with uh, those who are truly leading in this space to bring solutions to the various stakeholders who are gonna help uh, drive significant adoption at scale of uh, soil health practices. So with that, I'll take any questions.